Before I introduce our speakers, may I kindly request that you all come in and then take a seat? And once again, there's plenty of seats in the middle. The people to my right, feel free to come to the center. Feel free to come to the center. Thank you. So we will proceed with the next uh, item on the agenda. In this plenary session, we'll be looking at feeding the world, preserving the world from a scientific and technological point of view. Most of our African countries or most of the continent relies heavily on agriculture as a backbone of their economies. The following panelists and moderator will be discussing ways in which we can look at food security from a different angle. To direct this panel, I will call upon the moderator, Professor Adam Snyed from the University of Gulep to come forward and moderate the session and also introduce the panelists. Professor, you're welcome. Good morning. We're here today to discuss one of the greatest areas of scientific innovation on the continent. And I'm so happy to be here to, to discuss with such a high level panel. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to moderate this panel today to the next Einstein Forum organizers. Uh, today, we're at, at the, on the cusp of scientific innovations related to food security and sustainable agricultural development. Climate smart agriculture is an incredible area of innovation and scientific research. We're talking about interdisciplinary collaborations to advance uh, science for Africa's agricultural transformation. We're talking about feeding people in ways that are more sustainable. We're talking about uh, foods and dietary transitions towards climate smart foods. And we need to talk a little bit about the technical, social, political, and institutional environment that can enable uh, African food systems to become more climate smart. More sustainable agriculture faces barriers. There are lots of sciences. Just think about your breakfast this morning. How many different approaches to agricultural science contributed to each ingredient that you consumed? Now think about this for one second, that science that actually contributed to your food. There are more disciplines now than there were in the 20th century. We have 20th century disciplines related to food uh, science and agricultural science. And now there are new disciplines emerging, like agroecology, a different approach to science for agriculture and sustainability. So let me introduce our panelists. Today, uh, we're, we are very blessed to have uh, Dr. Usman Badian, the Africa Director for the International Food Policy uh, Research Institute, or IFPRI with us today. Dr. Badian, please come up and have a seat. Dr. Uh, Sanushka Naidu, a NEF fellow who we met yesterday, is a senior lecturer in the Department of Genetics at the University of Pretoria. <laughs> chef Pierre Chiem, the celebrated chef and co-founder of Yolele Foods and advocate for, for foods from Africa. And... <laughs> yes. Okay, she's here. Dr. Agnes Calabata has just joined us. She is the president for the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. And finally, uh, Dr. Simeon Ehui, the director of the Food and Agriculture Global Practice at the World Bank. So just uh, a quick and brief introduction related to format. Uh, we're going to start the session today with a presentation uh, from Chef Pierre. And then we're going to start a question and answer period uh, with the panelists, hopefully culminating in a discussion where I don't have to say a lot and where they can interact with each other. And then we're going to invite participation from the audience because we know that we have an incredible wealth of scientific knowledge in this room today. So, so Chef Pierre, would you please uh, come up and, and show us what's happening? Good morning. What is the chef doing here at the scientific <laughs> conference? Well, I'm here to talk about an ancient grain called fonio. 
And ancient grain, as you can read, is good for you, great for the planet, and even better for farmers. The challenge. Fonio is a grain that grows in the Sahel region of Africa. The Sahel is one of the hardest growing food region in the whole world. It has 135 million people, and there is infrequent water supply and extreme heat. You can see in the screen that the Sahel is going throughout, right south of the Sahara Desert from the Senegal region all the way to Eritrea. And by 2050, this population is set to double. What if I told you that under the Sahel's dry topsoil lies a tiny miracle? This ancient grain that we call Fonio, and that's been cultivated for more than 5,000 years. Fonio today grows in all these countries that you see, Benin, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Ghana, Guinea, Ivory Coast, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, Gambia, and Togo. But only a tiny group of these countries are really consuming Fonio in a regular basis. If you ask people from Senegal, for instance, most of them don't know what Fonio is unless they go to the southeast region, the poorest region of Senegal in Tambacounda and some parts of Casamance. And why is that? Fonio only takes two months to grow. It's the first crop to mature after the rainy season. They call it the hungry, uh, the hungry season crop because it comes when the other crops are gone. It's drought resistant. It has deep, extensive roots, allowing it to thrive in dry regions like the Sahel. It's a major boon for farmers challenged by climate change. Many smallholder fonio farms provide employment opportunities for women. It's healthy, it's gluten-free, it has three times more protein than ripe, ripe brown rice, it has more iron, more fiber, it's rich in amino acids, two amino acids in particular, methionine and cysteine, and those amino acids are rare in all the other major grains, rice, barley, you name it, wheat. It has a low glycemic in index. That means that it's great, it's recommended for people with diabetes. It cooks in five minutes, which is also a great thing. As a chef, this is what really attracted me to Fonio. So I studied a company in the United States, which where I'm based, I'm from Senegal, I'm based in New York. We started a company called Yolele Foods, and we decided to introduce Fonio to the US and to the other parts of the world. Because right now, consumers are more conscious of what they are eating, and they are looking for grains that are gluten-free, that's, that's a whole trend right now. They are looking for ancient grains, they are looking for nutritious grains. So the challenge was to introduce Fonio to this part of the world, and at the same time, make sure the smallholder communities that produce Fonio benefit from it. Yolele partnered with some of the world's largest food retailers, food markets, whole food markets, Amazon, Thrive Market, to name a few. And today we are selling through, sorry, I came too early to this one, but today we are selling to all through, through these uh, networks to the US, and we hope to even bring back Fonio to the cities like Dakar and, uh, and Abidjan, for instance, where you can easily see baguette breads and, and croissants made out of wheat, and we don't grow those products, and they're even less nutritious than Fonio. I'm showing these different food pictures to show you how a versatile fonio is. We've been able to make pastas with fonio. We hope to make nutrition bars with fonio, snacks with fonio. This, this here you can see jollof uh, croquettes with fonio, mango salad with fonio. Mafe, of course, the original way of preparing fonio with, with that peanut sauce in, in West Africa. Fonio sushi, Japanese could have sonio, fonio too. <laughs> <laughs> That's the vision. So Yolele is working to improve the quality of fonio processing with plans to build the world's first industrial scale fonio mill. The mill will buy at fair, fair trade market price from smallholder farmers, bringing employment to the region. And we hope that this mill will be open by late 2019. We are right now in the process of organizing it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chef Pierre.
This is a fascinating development. And Chef Pierre, more broadly though, beyond Fonio, what are Africans in terms of climate smart diets? Do you see changes in diets with what, with, in, in Senegal or beyond? How are people eating climate smart foods? Well, there's, there's lots of education that needs to be done still. I mean, um, again, like I was saying, in cities like, like Dakar, people are still thinking that what comes from the West is best, and we're still importing our food, which is unfortunate. Um, so education needs to be done not only by chefs, it has to be uh, policies behind it. Governments have to get involved, and, uh, and, and, and uh, entrepreneurs have to get involved promoting these local products that are fantastic and that are great for climate change adapted. Fonio is drought resistant and, uh, and that's what we need right now, these kind of crops. Mm, you mentioned the kind of intersection or the interdisciplinarity and this is really I think what this panel is trying to achieve with genetics and, and, and your, uh, from your position and also Dr. Usman Badian from, from IFPRI and, and just co to continue along the lines of African innovations for food security and for climate smart agriculture. You have this portfolio of 54 countries and you're looking at the continental scale. Well, what do you see as the innovations that are driving uh, climate smart diets and, and change? Thank you, um, and um, good morning to everyone. This is certainly a great innovation, uh, which I like. Uh, I, I love Fonio, by the way, uh, Chef Cham. Let me first uh, say what you understand under sustainable agriculture, right? And then I'm gonna talk about what uh, the um, science and innovation systems are contributing. We want sustainability because we wanna be producing more food with less resources that are used, meaning land, labor, water, pesticides, energy, chemicals. If you achieve to do that, then we are going on a trajectory of sustainable food systems. That's what we would like to do. But we also would like to produce safer food, greater health for plants and for animals. It's part of the sustainability as well. Mm. And finally, we would like to reduce waste and contamination along the value chain as you process more food. Mm. It is that broader, uh, um, uh, framework of sustainability that science and innovation systems in Africa have to contribute to, okay. which is very important. Uh, but you also said sustainable agriculture and food security. That means that access to food by vulnerable people that meets their needs has to be coupled with the needs and requirements of a sustainable agriculture. Those are very important. And that's where science and innovation have to bring uh, its contribution. Now, um, it's hard to discuss the contribution of science and innovation in broad and abstract terms. So what I've chosen to do is to highlight specific achievements, scientific innovation achievements that go towards supporting agriculture and the food systems. Let me first start with West Africa, uh, where um, scientists have been working on expanding the options to raise supply and fight pests while reducing the pressure on soil which is important contribution to sustainability. Uh, we have the example that the group of researchers did in Cote d'Ivoire, which is now in a, in a position to produce off-season banana, so that you don't just have to focus on a specific uh, time period of the year to do that. Uh, they have introduced pest-resistant rainy season tomato. Anybody who does vegetable production knows how it is difficult in the rainy season. It's in Mali and it's being used by farmers. Uh, they have homegrown vaccines against uh, Newcastle disease in poultry, allowing people in Ghana to expand uh, poultry uh, production. They're working on post-harvest technologies to add value and uh, uh, increase food safety. Uh, there are machines now, manual machines for oil extraction that can be used to reduce aflatoxin in groundnuts. We all know what it does in terms of uh, cancer and other things, uh, which is, of course, improving the value to the farmers of their production. Uh, there are uh, new millet varieties uh, in Senegal that are now being used in Cote d'Ivoire that can produce flour of a quality that can be supplemented into wheat and reduce the import bills and provide better food uh, for the farmers. That's the example for West Africa. I can go to the African level and, and talk about example of the African Agricultural Technology Foundations for which I serve as uh, chair of the Board of Trustees. I have to disclose that, but I do like what they do, that's why I've chosen this job to, uh, to be there. 
Uh, they have developed significant varieties of maize, trigger resistance. Anybody who does maize uh, know what trigger means. N obnoxious weeds that reduce everything that you have in terms of uh, potential for, 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 for production. They have a BT cowpea, yes, BT cowpea that is resistant to pot borer, allowing people to produce a very rich and healthy legume. I think Chef Chan will agree with me. They have pest resistance. Um, BT maize, which is unfortunately not just being used in South Africa, which I think has a huge potential uh, across the, the continent. There is work on stress tolerance varieties, uh, drought tolerant maize. Uh, you see how uh, climate change does. Um, they have rice varieties that are water efficient, salt tolerant, and nitrogen efficient uh, that are coming to the market, as well as um, uh, hybrid rice for the first time with parental lines from Africa. So there's a lot happening in, in the systems. But there's also uh, work happening across Africa in terms of providing beta data and supporting policy making decisions for better targeting of interventions by policymakers. In particular, understanding where poverty is, where the vulnerable people are so that we can have the social protection systems to link sustainable production and uh, food, food uh, security. So um, to conclude, uh, African science innovation systems are indeed contributing, contributing greatly. We still have the question though, whether it is at a scale to take us down to a road of sustainable agriculture and food security today and in the future. Okay, that's great. Um, okay. Barriers to entry for innovators in Africa? You've discussed multiple innovations here. What, what do you feel from your position are the biggest barriers to, to African scientists and African innovators having an impact? There is a very short sentence. Lack of critical mass. Mm. And I'll break that down a little bit. Um, I've been working in uh, this profession for the last 30 something years and I've traveled across the continent. I've had partnership all over uh, the continent. There are just too few resource in terms of expertise, laboratory, institutional infrastructure, and others. Let me give you a few numbers. Uh, the numbers of researchers in the ACT system in Africa rose from 1,000 in 2000 to about 1,500 for a continent of how many millions of people, over a billion of people. Yes, we increased by 50%, but we're way below where we need to be. Second, most of those researchers are concentrated in three countries, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Nigeria, 50% of them. PhDs are about 27%, with the complexity of agriculture and where we're going in terms of research, just not enough. Uh, more than half of the PhD holders in the systems are older than 50 to 60. We're talking about youth, we're talking about science, we're talking about technology. Here is an area where youth is scarce and we need to invest quite a lot uh, in, in there. Women make out 24%. Uh, there's no question that the need for engendering science and technology is even more, uh, uh, more acute than in terms of uh, rejuvenating it. Let's talk about funding levels, which is also impeding um, uh, critical mass and therefore the capacity to go to scale. Total spending for uh, ag research and science innovation went from 1.7 billion to 2.5 billion in 2011 way below what we need uh, to do. And most of the funding concentrated again in Nigeria, Kenya, and Republic of South Africa, 50%. The growth rate is below 5% for most countries except five of funding going into these systems. And the spending share of agricultural GDP going into research innovation has decreased. That is just unacceptable, from 0 0.7 to 0 0.5 of agricultural GDP. That just is not going to give us the critical mass we need to go to scale. And more importantly, 60% of funding going to science and innovation in agriculture comes from external sources, which are highly volatile. So funding for research and innovation in Africa is twice as volatile than funding for research and innovation in other regions of the world. Those are main constraints to the individual researcher as well as to the systems to be able to go to scale, mm. despite all the efforts that are making. That's where we need the biggest changes, funding levels, 
and in terms of staffing and skill and expertise. Thank That's you. That's great. Thank you. So, Dr. Naidu, we've been discussing innovations, and, and I just want to, to clarify that you were uh, recently promoted to associate professor at the University of Pretoria from January 1st this year, so congratulations. Uh, today, though, I, I want to ask you specifically about your experiences as an innovator, how governments and business have supported your development, and how you think that governments and businesses more generally can support lab-based innovations for, for food security and climate-smart agriculture in the African context? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And I think I have been quite well supported. And I want to thank the National Research Foundation back in South Africa for an innovative program that required the partnering of industry, government, and academia. So this is the technology and human resource for industry program. And that has supported my research for the past few years. It's taken the basic research that I've done, and it's looked into ways of making that into products for industry. I have been also well supported because I work within forestry, and we have a good understanding in South Africa between forestry companies for the challenges that face forestry coming right now and into the future. So they have put quite a lot of resources into looking at pests and pathogens that exist in forestry and looking at tree defense mechanisms that one could use into the future. However, we still have a very long road to travel, and that's because we need to take this basic research and to convert that into something that's a tool so that we can use it in something like forest trees, which I consider a fiber crop. And take that knowledge that is a deep, rich knowledge because it has been well supported, and we can then translate that into other crops where we have inadequate knowledge. And it's in particular, I think that we need to be looking at these orphan crops because who will invest and who will know enough about the genetics of those crops so that when we rely on them in future, because we're going to have lots of challenges with climate change, will we know what to plant where at the right time? And, and this relies on bridging that chasm between the basic into translational research. Okay, I want to follow up a little bit on your specific area. As a political scientist, I'm, I'm drawn to, to political conflict and the intersection of science and, and politics. And, and I know in particular, uh, there have been lots of, of politics mapping onto your own research area, and you're not alone. I mean, many other innovators related to, to agriculture and food applications have this. So, so what is your experience with politics and, and, and these, these questions that, that map onto your research? How do you navigate this as, as a young African researcher? So I think that we have been very cautious regarding some of these technologies, so specifically transgenic technology and looking at genetically modified organisms. And I think that we have some regulatory frameworks in place, but it would be fantastic if that was facilitated and that we could adopt technologies right now and have them staggered and ready to deploy when the time comes. If we're going to take 10, 15, 20 years to get to a product that's absolutely necessary regarding climate change, and there's so many examples of this. For example, um, the papaya that is, is primarily GM in Hawaii now, and it was saved because it was transgenic. And if you think about the American chestnut as an example, because of, of pathogens, there comes a time when these technologies are sort of the major tool that has to be used. And for that, I think we need to be talking more about adopting these technologies, adopting these tools, and also increase public awareness and understanding of what this technology entails, and not to be fearful of it, to understand how it can be adopted as a tool. Looking back, I think there was a study that was done in 2014 doing a meta-analysis of genetic modified foods and what the contribution has been over the years. And there's been a 37% decrease in the use of pesticides, a 22% increase in yield, and 68% increase in profit to farmers. These are really good reasons to think about GM technology as a tool going forward. Right. 
That's great. And, and this actually brings in, uh, I think, Dr. Calabata, I should turn to you on this one because we were talking about innovations and, and from your position at the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, you're, you're constantly thinking about the role of agricultural innovations, but I'm particularly interested in, in, in the roles that you see for, for local technologies and local content and, and the application of, of local content to, to climate smart agriculture. Thank you. Um, it's interesting that we are talking about local content here in Rwanda. This is a country that prides itself in building whatever it builds out of local content. Whether it's programs in agriculture, whether it's programs in justice, whether it's programs so many other things, we really as a, a nation build on what, what we know. Now from an agricultural perspective, if you looked if you, you want to see where the future of, uh, for example, Rwanda's agriculture is going, you can't fail to notice two things. The One Cow Per Poor Family Program, which is the Jirina program, that really comes from how people treat uh, the whole uh, uh, cow culture and, and, and really building on that and designing programs. In a short while, this country is going to be having a white revolution like you saw in India, specifically shaped by how the Jirina program was designed that really draws from the people's culture. So that's just looking at locally, what is acceptable locally and how do you build on that? There are other things like land consolidation program, which this country also drove, and which very interestingly is a program that is being used by, by China for the same reasons and with different, different results. Rwanda used land consolidation program to really encourage communities to come up with some uh, Rwandan typical green revolution where you grow the same commodity, increase volumes, market viability of commodities, you know, so that they could, uh, from the small plots farmers on, so that they could have market viability. In China, for exactly for the same, starting from the same point where smallholder farmers have small plots, they are designing an agricultural system that looks at consolidation and they are designing apps that link people who have land to people who don't have land. They're designing large-scale farming based on small land, land holdings, and they're designing policies in the agricultural sector that define how agriculture gets done differently. So there's really um, room for local content. I just wanted to add one thing based on what we do as an institution in Agra. We, um, we drive technologies from a perspective of improved seeds. We would like to, farmers to have better access to seeds. We would like them to have better access to fertilizers. And we do recognize that we have to build on what exists locally. We work on across 15 varieties. We work with local national institutions so that they can build and, and start with what they have locally. And uh, from that, let me just give you an example of one young girl that has actually come up with a bean variety that cooks for 40 minutes as opposed to four hours. Just think about the amount of wood that saves the environment, but also think about what it does to the women and their time that they spend <clears throat> on cooking beans. So we do that for re disease resistance, we do that for, for a number of other things. But I just wanted to give you um, one more example on, uh, on local content when it comes to infrastructure. As an institution, we now fund what we call, uh, in, in, a number, in about three countries, we, we fund what, what we call Uber tractors. Why would Uber tractors be important? Because very few African farmers can afford to own tractors themselves. Because of that, you start, the young people have come up with schemes where they are saying, you know what, I can set up a program where farmers can actually borrow tractors, but also tractor owners can track what tractors are doing so that they actually get paid. Tractors are not being packed in places and, and they are not working, which is the major problem. In addition to the fact that most farmers wouldn't anyway be able to own a tractor. So you have a tractor service, you have your tractor actually working and you are sitting in your office doing your work, you don't have to worry about that. So, so these type of things are all beginning to, are technologies that are beginning to be built on the local situation and, 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 and um, are influencing how agriculture gets done. I have a number of other examples, but those are enough for a start. Uh, well, I'll just follow right up on those examples because there, there, are, there are so many. And, and this, is, this is the question then about aggregating 
all of, all of these African innovations from, from rural areas and in all African countries and, and the clearinghouse of knowledge and the mobilization of, of knowledge about African technological innovations related to agriculture, like what can be developed in that area? What, what, how can development partners help you in your role to better disseminate and scale up the application of these innovations? So one of the programs we have very intentionally put in place as AGRA is a program called Partnerships. Partnerships recognizes that we have a multiplicity of institutions, especially in the African landscape, all of them doing different things, all sometimes doing exactly the same thing with exactly the same people. And sometimes we don't know what each one is doing. So from a partnerships pers perspective, we hope to start working, very intentionally working with each other so that our resources can count more, but also we can share knowledge better. That's number one. Number two is we also put in place, uh, uh, as AGRA, we have the largest forum for the continent, the African Green Revolution Forum. In fact, this year, it is in Kigali on the 3rd to 7th of September. It's coming home to Kigali. This forum, <laughs> this forum brings over 2,000 people in agriculture in one room from private sector, from public sector, uh, from youth from, to old people to everybody to really come and talk and discuss the knowledge we are seeing in agriculture. We also encourage other people, for example, the World Bank has a side event, a whole day side event on irrigation, so that they can bring all the knowledge in the world on irrigation together and be able to share. IDRC has a whole day event on research. We as AGRA publish uh, what we call African Agricultural Status Report. Usman is one of the key people that contribute to this report. And this really gathers knowledge from across the continent so that we can get to be on the cutting edge of what's happening in the agricultural sector on the continent. So there are a number of ways, but I think for me the bottom line is if we started talking to each other, because sometimes we find exactly the same things for the same results. If we started talking to each other, building partnerships within the agricultural sector in Africa, there's an opportunity to go further than where we are going currently. Thank you. Okay, maybe uh, Dr. Hui, let's, let's get you in on this a little bit from your position uh, at the World Bank. We know the macro barriers and structural challenges that African food markets face. And, and now we have this new challenge that's mapped on, the climate challenge. And, and what are the latest models telling us uh, from your perspective? What, 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 what do we need to know more about? Okay. Thank you very much. And let me seize the opportunity of uh, my presence here to um, thank the organizers for inviting me to this panel. It's my first time to be uh, to attend the uh, NEF, and I, I don't think that I'll be missing the next ones, because I truly believe that the next Einstein will really be an African. I've not met Dr. Travel Youssef, but I believe this is him sitting there from the future, so it's really exciting you know, for me to, to be here. Now, you asked me a question about uh, you know, uh, models and uh, an area for climate, and, and, and beyond what World Bank uh, has been doing on macro side. Yes, we do indeed uh, uh, work with the universities and other researchers on you know, modeling uh, for climate uh, change. Now, the, the most available data that we have on modeling is from the IPCC, okay? Uh, which is indicated really that uh, Africa will be really the region that will be most affected by the impact of climate change. Now, why is that important? We're talking about a region where the global food demand will increase significantly by 155% of between now and 2050. This is really huge. We're talking about a, a, a continent where uh, by, uh, 20, by 2030, we're going to have a food market worth $1 trillion. We're talking about a continent where the import bill is about $35 billion now and which will increase to $110 billion in 15 years' time. The question is, Africa will need to rise to be able to meet this challenge. How is going to happen is through you know, production. Unfortunately, if we don't address the issue of climate change now, it, there will be no way by which we'll be able to meet you know, this, this challenge. Now, what the model is saying is, what, is that the worst case scenario, we are going to get yield decline between 27 and 32 percent okay, uh, of, of cereal crops, uh, uh, maize, uh, 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 granites, uh, sorghum, millet, okay, especially in the Sahel region that we just heard about, that's being hit seriously by, by, the, uh, uh, by, by the climate change. 
this is going to be very serious. There are other models that are coming up called uh, you know, global circulation models that are also indicating that yield can go as down, as much down as 50%. And that's a big risk. We need to be able to do uh, something about it. There are other you know, impacts that are happening that are not modeled that we need to pay attention to. The issues of, let's say, the pests and diseases, for example, that are emerging as a result of climate change. Okay, and the pests and diseases are actually impacting on you know, yield. We're we'll talking about uh, yield losses, about one six, or, 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 uh, about uh, one six of uh, yield that have been lost due to, due to that. This, this is a problem. We also need to look at how the, the, the livestock sector is impacted on. For example, we all, in Africa, the livestock is really dependent on the natural resources, the forages, you know, the pasture, and these are also impacted upon by the climate change. This is also a factor to take into account. If we want to uh, avoid the risks and conflict that we see you know, in Africa today as a result of movement of livestock from one area to another, imagine the case of what we see in Benue State, for example, where people are killing each other. You know, it is a result of the uh, fight for basic natural resources between the animals and the human beings. So, and we cannot ignore the impact of climate there. Okay, so these are some of the information that we have and we need to be able to really respond to uh, in, in a more systematic way, you know, and be very diligent about it. Okay, so at the, at the World Bank then, there's a recalibration going on right. in, in terms of the funding of, uh, of climate smart initiatives. So could you maybe tell us a little bit more about how the World Bank is reorienting its approach to agriculture in light of the challenge? Thank you. So, um, since 2011, when the World Bank has really uh, started to increase its uh, working on the climate uh, investment plan, we have uh, sig significantly increased our support to countries to the tune of $1 billion as of last year, all focused on climate uh, smart agriculture. We have uh, something called an African Climate Business Plan, which is worth $19 billion you know, that to be reached by 2020. And, the, and currently, and in that you have also the climate smart agriculture, which is part of it. And we are working with our client to try to do that. I'm proud to, I'm pleased to say that uh, we have supported a lot of, uh, you know, climate investment plans in countries. For example, I can tell you a case of Niger, where we have had uh, one of the first, you know, climate smart agriculture project that we have supported in Africa, okay, of 111 million dollars and today reaching some 114,000 farmers, you know, to, to adopt uh, uh, drought tolerant uh, 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 seeds and working with the research like CGI system, ICRISAT and so on in, 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 in Kenya we're doing the same, in Zambia for example, you know, we, we're also working uh, along this line. So, so we are uh, really investing a lot. We have a goal to be able to have, um, to reach uh, about three million hectares of land that are climate smart, I mean, that are utilizing climate smart practices, and also want to be able to reach some 25 million farmers between now and, and, and 2020. So the agenda is huge, and we're working with different countries on this agenda. Excellent. We've been able to hear from, from everybody on this incredibly important topic. And before we open this up to the, to the floor, to questions, and I'll give everybody a, a couple minutes to think of some questions for our amazing panelists here today, I, I would like to hear 30-second answers from each of you on, on one core question in this area. What are the threats to, to a climate-smart future for agriculture? What are the threats that you see? And, and, and I know it's only 30 seconds, but we're, we're, we have a very limited amount of time today. So the, the threats that you see, the principal threats and how we might be able to best them, if you can get that out there as quickly as possible, maybe it'll be a minute each. And, and we'll start with, uh, with Dr. Badian. Thank you very much. Uh, the threat is likely unknown. Uh, it's changes in the production conditions, uh, unpredictability, volatility, uh, temperature changes, and what have you. Uh, there's only one answer to that is the mastery and use of science and technology to deploy it uh, to deal with nature. That's what humankind has been doing for centuries and millennia. It's going to be the same thing. It's not going to be different. I think the major threat is not integrating and not sharing the knowledge because if we are all trying to reinvent the wheel, we will never get it to our goal of climate smart agriculture. 
One of the major threats for me is the disappearance of the biodiversity. The, some of the crops that I used to see growing up in Senegal that are no longer around, and this is due to climate change. I would, I would say that for me the major threat would be lack of inaction coming from um, um, uh, probably prolonged or inability of our leaders to take action in the right, at the right time in the right place. Yesterday I was uh, on one of the airlines and I was, I used to hear that on Rwanda, but this time I was going to Kenya and they were saying, oh, by the way, if you have plastic bags, you need to remove your stuff from and, and, and leave them in the airplane. It's good to see countries taking, up, taking action on things that impact the environment. If many more countries put up climate smart action plans then we will be able to, 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 to deal with what is coming on because definitely it's coming on, but the leadership is needed for this to be the case. Now, for me, the, the biggest threat is the, really the misallocation of government uh, resources on, to address the climate smart issues. So you have countries that are actually spending enough, a lot of resources on agriculture but are targeting the wrong type of investment to, to do. So the issues of subsidies that are wrongly you know, targeted, and don't get me wrong, subsidies are important and, and, and we must do them to be able to move up. But what kind of support the subsidies will actually support is important. So if you know, resources can actually be allocated efficiently you know, to address climate smart you know, issues, public investments, you know, into research, education, to be able to support, you know, research in this area, we will not be able to, to address the issues significantly. So that's, for me, the biggest threat. The hard, the hard challenges, and, and of course we need to, to be thinking about solutions as the biggest employment generator still in the context of Africa, still the biggest economic source of economic growth across Africa, the sector, and, and possibly then the biggest source for scientific innovation and employment of scientists could be this area. And as we think more about uh, what we want to ask the panelists, let's say maybe three questions uh, from, from the plenary floor. And, and I have one hand here. We're going to take three and then open it up to everybody to answer. And then I believe we're going to have to wrap quickly. So maybe over there on the far right. That's the lady. Yes, it's the, yeah, you've got it. Oh, thank you very much. Um, as you might actually see on television every year, there is a drought famine in Somalia, East Africa. Um, sadly, people in Somalia don't like to eat be, uh, food that has been produced in Somalia. They like to eat pasta, spaghetti, um, rice that is imported into Somalia. What will be the take home message so I can help my people back home in Somalia? What will be the solution? Thank you. Question right there um, in the middle. Thank you. I'm Jean Bosco Gahutu from the University of Rwanda, College of Medicine and Sciences. My question goes to Pierre Thiam. What is the yield of the fonio? I put that question because if the yield is limited, then there is possibility of crossbreeding with another cereal that has maybe lower nutrient value, and the result would be a crop with high nutrient value and available for the whole world. <laughs> Thank you. One further question over here on the, the left. Excuse me, I'm uh, Dr. Demba Fabambay, I'm from Senegal. I work for a project of USAID et qui s'appelle USAIDRA, Éducation et Recherche en Agriculture. Euh, C'est un projet d'initiative Feed the Future et qui travaille avec l'ensemble des, des universités, les écoles de formation et aussi euh, les, les producteurs, les transformateurs pour essayer de renforcer l'agriculture au niveau du Sénégal. Euh, Grosso modo, si je résume, parce que j'ai des brochures qui sont en anglais, c'est pourquoi j'ai préféré parler en français pour que 
j'en profite, mais les brochures en anglais pour montrer tout ce qu'on a eu à faire à la démarche. Euh, les, les leçons learning qu'on peut dire par rapport à ce projet, c'est ce que disait tout de suite euh, euh, madame de, qui, qui est de Agra. C'est dans, en Afrique, on a beaucoup d'expertise dans le domaine agricole, mais les gens travaillent de façon isolée. En mettant les gens ensemble, on arrive à faire beaucoup de choses. Donc, dans notre projet, ça a été notre démarche. C'est d'abord de faire descendre les gens de l'université pour qu'ils aillent vers les producteurs et travailler aussi avec le secteur privé. OK, thank you. Voilà. Voilà. Thank Donc, you je, je, je voulais euh, dire tout simplement euh, comme question, surtout par, par rapport à, à professeur Bajan, c'est que uh, le... I think we're going to have to stop it there with the first one. Okay, so we okay. have about five minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. 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 Yeah, we're, 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 okay. we're pressed for time. Merci. Uh, uh, we have uh, five minutes left and we have a minute each to respond to these questions and also to kind of summarize uh, the solutions, the, the forward momentum uh, with science walking hand in hand with, with scientists from across the continent to advance climate smart agriculture. And maybe we can, uh, we can start down at the end uh, with Dr. Louis. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, the, the, <clears throat> the, first, the first question was, is really, but I, I think you can generalize that. What can we do? What are the solutions? Um, first of all, I think uh, enhancing capacity locally is very important <clears throat> for people, local organizations, at an original, national, and local level to recognize what the impact of climate is on, the, on, on their economies. That's, that's one. The second is regional cooperation. It's quite important. Climate change does not have any border. There's no difference whether or not it hits Rwanda or DRC or uh, another country. So the question is, you know, regional cooperation is quite uh, important. The other point is the issue of data. It's quite important. Lack of data you know, or insufficient uh, poor data can lead to wrong decisions. So we need to be able to work together. At the World Bank, for example, we are having a private public partnership and we have something called an ag observatory and we can actually tell you know, several weeks, months ahead what may happen to a particular country you know, as a result of you know, climate change and try to uh, prevent it. So these are some of the solutions that, uh, that uh, you know, I can talk to. And, and, and but essentially, it's a question of regional cooperation, local capacity building, education and training is quite important. Thank you. Dr. Gallagher. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to speak to the question from Somalia. Uh, just to, um, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, what is happening is probably a result of so many things. Uh, the institution I work for, Agra, works in a number of countries. Would, we actually worked in Somalia and we were working in Somalia but had to go out because of what was happening in Somalia. So a lot of work that we could have done to ensure that Somalia has locally ad adopted varieties didn't happen. So I hope that as things normalize, we can, many of us can go back to Somalia and make sure that that work is happening, but also support local Somalian institutions to grow. The second thing, and probably most important, is Somalia is not the only country that is importing so much food. We have a $40 billion worth of imports, of things we can make on this continent. So I think, again, I, I always keep going back to leadership. I think, again, there's a real issue here around how we start working with people who have money to invest in our countries. We may not have the money and the capacity for now, and we will have it as we continue growing it. But for now, we need money and capacity, and that sometimes sits somewhere. It doesn't have to be exported to Africa. It can actually be made in Africa if we create the right conducive environments. And that way, we, we will not export the jobs that we export every time we send a dollar out. So I just wanted to say that uh, Ethiopia has reversed it, this with, with regards to spaghetti and macaroni. It's making its own now with varieties of of spaghetti that are grown within Ethiopia, I mean, uh, uh, with varieties that they can use for making spaghetti from within Ethiopia. So it's not like these things are not doable, but the environment has to be conducive for the research to happen, for people to invest and all these things. So I, I would say that uh, there's hope 
because there's already drought tolerant varieties that are in different countries that Somalia can access to. Um, thank you. Uh, quickly, how's the yield of Fonio? Right now, Fonio is uh, producing 600,000 tons per year in Africa. And uh, Fonio is also nicknamed the lazy farmer's crop because farmers just throw the seeds on the ground and that's, that's all it is. We believe that yield can be doubled by just training farmers in better agricultural practices. Of course, crossbreeding that you're suggesting could be a solution, but uh, also, again, training farmers and, 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 and working with them, training them and giving them, equipping them could be a solution to double the fonio production and feed the rest of the, ourselves and the rest of the world. So in terms of solutions, I'd like to talk about my own field in plant genetics. And there I'm also very hopeful. And that's because we have these tools and we can now select resistant varieties. And we can do that using these molecular markers. And we can do genomic selection. So we can, based on the genome of individual plants, we can then determine whether it is well adapted and better suited to certain climates and make better matches in that way. The other technology that we, we are looking closely at is, is this CRISPR-Cas9 and how we can use gene editing to look at susceptibility in different plants and see if just by modifying something like this, we can bring about a resistant individual. So in my field, I think there's quite a lot of solutions that can also be contributed there. Very good. Thank you. Uh, first, to uh, the challenge of climate change and the solution to that. I think uh, it's going to be science-based. There's really nothing much we, we can do. Uh, we have to invest in mastering the technology of tomorrow, in particular biotechnology. Uh, if the discussion of do we take or don't we take GMO is extremely passive. I think the right question is do we have the expertise and the laboratories to master biotechnology and deal with uh, climate smart agriculture? Otherwise, we are doomed. Uh, and I think it should be within the reach of every government to double the number of PhDs in the science system within the next five to 10 years. Why aren't we doing it? I think it's important. Lastly, to the um, uh, Somalia questions, uh, I'm from Senegal. And there were times it was very difficult for a lot of people to consume millet. They were using bread and other things instead of millet or rice. Uh, you cannot force people to eat what they don't like. You cannot close the markets to have them eat what's inside because it's going to be expensive. But we know from our research that the growing middle class, which may be eating the past and others, really would like to spend more money on more sophisticated traditional staples. The processed, packaged, and better quality traditional staples would sell. In Senegal today, because millet is processed into different types of meals, the consumption in the urban areas is surging again. So I think that pushing production of local staples supporting processing, making more sophisticated, more appealing food to the urban classes, you could reverse that trend. Great. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, finally. Thank you, Professor Adam, for leading such a brilliant panel discussion. And thank you to all speakers. You may rejoin your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share with you the following program. I will need your attention, please, because we'll be having four concurrent sessions. There will be four parallel sessions taking place. So if I could have your attention for, for you to know where to go, that would be great. So the first parallel session will take place in this very room, and the parallel session is titled Changing the Way We Learn, Building Scientific Culture 